Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Please be seated. A big thank you to Pastor Kwaju and Pastor Tui for the invitation and the Covenant Nation family. Uh, okay. I saw Yvonne, so I just wanted to wave. It's a few familiar faces in the house. Well, congratulations to uh, Covenant for yet another uh, platform and for the unusual structure for this year. You know, separating the girls from the boys <laughs> in some ways, you know, and all that. But it's okay, because after you've done a lot of um, national mind setting, there's room for you to start dealing with specifics. And I, and I think it's the right strategy, in a sense, so that people can find themselves in the midst of all. We've talked and talked and talked and talked. It's time to work with it and all of that. So to all the amazing women who have spoken ahead of me, thank you. God bless you. I mean, Nikki and I come a long way. We always laugh. I remember the days on flights when we would stay at the back of the plane and sit by the door and just throughout the entire flight about all our issues as manufacturing girls in this land. But they're quite a club of us. But you know the funny thing? So you would know the girls are tough. For every type of industry where the girls and the boys started, in most cases, and no disrespect to the men, I'm a mother of only boys, so I'm not against the men, and I'm married to a great guy. But the girls survived where many guys did close shop. So there's something about the girls that tells you when they mean to do it, they get it done. And once they're committed to it, they stay with it and they fight the many battles that are required. Now, um, I sort of have a wrap up uh, assignment in a sense. Um, when I think about it, and I'm uh, glad that I listened to Nikkei's uh, story because as a manufacturing girl, I can do many markers in it. And every one of us that's built companies, I've been in manufacturing in Nigeria for 35 years. Yes, because we started very early. I was in my 20s when I started. So we grew in the middle of all the crises of Nigeria. I can tell you many landmarks. But we're still here. So that tells you something. So what, what I'm going to talk about is leading an organization through change. In Nikkei's story, she's already given you some life stories of leading an organization through change. So I'm going to take you through a scenario because I want you to understand if you build in a nation that is as dynamic as Nigeria, your mindset has to pre be prepared to respond to situations as they occur. I remember one time, I think it was 2004, I was in business school in Spain, and then government had a change of policy that critically affected my business. And one of my Spanish business partners, the guy flew from Bilbao to come and meet me in Barcelona. And he sat down with me and said, Ibuku, explain to me how your government changed policy just like how many weeks ago. And how you're already telling me this is what you've decided to do. This is what, how can you turn around so quickly? I said, well, I'm a Nigerian. <laughs> I go to sleep every day expecting something to happen. The only thing I've also learned to do is when it happens, I don't run away from it is how we lasted this long. I find how to respond to it in order to move forward. So we all in our different ways, as Nigerian entrepreneurs or people in business or in our careers, we lead change in different ways every day, but we do not recognize it and give it the value of what we do. Now, one more thing, I want to put a gender dimension to it. Because I want you to understand that the peculiarities about women when it comes to leading change and the peculiarities that work for and against women based on how we are. In terms of the fact when you need change, you're going to have to give up something. You're going to have to commit to changing ways. Sometimes you shut some things down completely. Sometimes you let some people go. Sometimes you detach and separate yourself from some people. Because we're emotional beings as women, we tend to be less able to do it 
than our male counterparts who are more, you know, aggressive about just cut and paste. You cut, you're working, you're good. You're not, you're out. But we are attached. Our heart is in most things that we do. And that in itself can become a vulnerability as change agents. However, that same nature combined with other things about us as women, because we're nurturers, we're builders of community, we're connected, we like to manage relationships, we like to have our heart in us, they also become powerful tools for managing the process of change. As I go along, you will understand some of the things I'm pointing out now, because in managing change, you have a lot of people, emotions, lives, situations, to manage and the way you manage that process can determine whether you're able to succeed with your change process or not so i want you to come from your feminine side and recognize that the things you do every day they are your assets they're not always your liability okay there's nothing permanent in life except change Every time, you know, it's easy. Just go and look at your picture, at least for those of us that are a little older. I can look at my wedding picture and I'll see this skinny, tall girl that got married. And then I remember right now, she's got some heavy backside and she's carrying it well. But that's how we are. You know, it's life, transformation, things happen. And you look around you, you look at neighborhoods, you look at pictures, you see the changes in the pictures that you were shown by Mrs. Ogulesi and the changes and transformation to where they are now. For all of us, across the pathway of your journey, there are seasons of change. Even in weather, dry season is different from raining season. That is life. Nothing is permanent. And in your life, in your career, in your journey, you must accept that there will always be need for change. So why should you have a mentality that gets stuck? You need to unbundle your mind and unwind it and open up for the fact that sometimes the change that happens around you is not against you, it's for you. However, every change can be against you if you do not have the right mindset, if you do not have the right approach, if you do not take it on and decide. I remember that same story I was telling you about this Spanish guy that came. I mean, government announced in network news, 2004 January, I think it was, I can almost remember the date, change of government policy that literally was going to wipe away 15 years of my work building my business. So there were two things, two options. Either decide to continue by becoming a smuggler, which would destroy the value system with which I had built my business and the value system that I believed in and that I wanted to build going forward or that I would have to rethink my business and think of how to maintain who I am so in the process of change it's important that before you even get there some things are not negotiable change does not mean everything about you changes change requires that you understand the things about you that define who you are the things that speak to the strength of your person your character your personality your personal brand what will you die defending what are the non-tradable parts of your life so when it happened it was either it was easy become a smuggler bring everything in and be selling and use nigeria and government as an excuse or remember that I said to myself when I was starting my business at 25 going on 26, I will never pay a bribe and I will never sleep with a man to get a job. And therefore I had a responsibility, even then growing as a Christian girl, which I became a Christian just before my 28th birthday, I was raised a Muslim. But growing as a Christian girl, the values I had imbibed through my faith that I considered important to me, was I going to fight to maintain them or was I going to betray them now that I had a challenging situation? So it's important for you to spend some time with yourself. Define who you are. Define the things that are non-tradable about you. At that moment of that trial and that changing situation, 
I knew there were certain things I could not do. So I was not going to become a smuggler because then I'll have to say to God, thank you for the times things were good, but now I've got to survive. And your values cannot help me to survive now. Now, I wonder what I would have done when the next trouble came because then I would have abandoned God on the way. So in making those decisions, be sure of the things that do not change. So the message here is change happens, but there's some things in your life that shouldn't change. Pay attention to the things that shouldn't change. Just because you haven't been promoted at work, do not sleep with the guy who has the power to control your promotion. Because it's still a temporary situation. It will pass. And somewhere along the line, maybe the guy himself is the one you are going to have to consider for promotion somewhere else. You never know. So just make sure that you are doing the right thing. So if you are leading change in an organization, one of the first things you must do is define who you are as an organization, even as you define who you are as a person. Define you. Are you a change maker? You have a strategic mind? You, you, are, you are innovative? You are an effective leader? Be confident about who you are. I always say to people, I know who I am. I know my biggest asset. I haven't walked through 35 years of working through uh, building enterprises and working within corporate uh, uh, board level in different ways. I know that my biggest asset is a strategic mind. I also know that I'm self-assured and I would stand for that which is right. I know I will fight for integrity and values no matter what it costs me. And as I've learned, even in the last short while, it was worth fighting for. Sometimes you pay a short-term price of pain for the right things. But ultimately, time proves you to be right. And time always tells his own story. So do a review of where you are as an organization at that point. Understand what the issues are so that you know what you need to change and what you mustn't touch. Because in the process of change, it isn't everything. When Nika told you the story about them pivoting during uh, um, COVID, she told you it was about using the assets they already had. The assets were not discarded. The workmen were not discarded. Their processes were not discarded. The quality that they were committed to was not discarded. What they pivoted to was the application of those resources to something else. And the retraining of the minds of the people to say, look, the attention to detail for a medical tool is different to one for just clothing. But there are values that are transferable across all lines and there are values that will be specific because of that particular thing. And that is what you pay your attention to. Okay, I'm jumping. Now, go back. Okay, it's not just you. But I know what I'm doing. I think, I think it's the system. So I'm going to go on my, on my laptop, on my iPad, on my phone, and move faster than waiting for it to come. You guys can follow the screen. <laughs> I will follow my own, uh, my own uh, slides on my phone. Okay. So now, organization change is the process through which, yes, is the process through which a company undergoes any transformation, internally or externally. So you can find yourself uh, subject to change, not because you created it. If you don't create the situation, you still have to respond to it. Like I said, government made a law. It impacted me. I had to respond to it. I didn't create it, but I have to respond to it. So that's the external. Sometimes it's internal because things happen within your company that make you realize that the strategy you were following or the way you are going is not working anymore. However, because of our general nature and emotional attachment, sometimes we hold on to a dying strategy without making the change on time. The tech industry is full with a lot of casualties that happens in, in that industry because of that. I mean, if we go as far back as the difference between a VHS and a Betamax was about making a choice. The market made a choice and one was gone. Well, the difference between VHS and uh, CDs was market making a choice. Change happened. Whether you liked it or not, it came and it happened. And then all of a sudden, between CDs and what? MP3, any of those things, all the technology. You don't even know you have to keep up because the speed of change is so fast 
that it's not under your control. So your mind must always think about the fact that you do not control the factors that lead you to have to change. So in your business, it means you must be educationally aware of what is going on. You must know what your industry, as a young woman in furniture manufacturing, it was important for me to go to all the major furniture fairs in the world. I would save my money for that. Why? I had to know what the thinking was. I had to know what design lines were being pushed. I had to know what products were being used. I had to know what lines of solution were being introduced in the industry. And sometimes that's the difference between me and the competition on a deal. Because you're bidding for a project. I remember um, one particular insurance company. They were building their new head office company. And they had, we had, we were trying so hard to get the job. In between that, I knew I was pregnant. So I was leaving to go and have the baby. I'd gone and gone and gone. They weren't ready, you know, to execute the bid at, at that point. So I said, okay, I'll keep track. But at a the point, they said to me, okay, you know what we want? They described something that didn't exist. How was I able to solve the problem? Because when I go to the fairs and I collect material, I have ideas of what is going on. I locked myself in the house for two, three days, had papers spread all around from the different companies and the things I picked at the fair. Started looking for options of how to put the things together to create a solution for them. I went back to them and said, this is what you're looking for. They said, yes. I said, okay, I'll come back to you. I got on the plane went to Italy and went to companies to say, will you sell me this component from your line? Will you sell me this? If I buy your whole thing, I can't deliver at the price that my client can pay. But if you sell me this part, if you give me the right to reproduce this part locally in Nigeria with a welder to create an internal structure that I'd have to pay a lot of money for, and if I use our wood to create these panels here, but you give me the top and this material, I will create this solution. The company found it funny. But then they agreed, sold me the right and the finishing covers and allowed me to reproduce and then sold me the other component. I came back to the company and I said, this is what you want. This is how we'll produce. I can deliver at this price. They looked at me. I said, yes. That's how I got the project. And I remember that on the day they were opening this building, they had all these big people. And I think the chairman of the company then was uh, one big allergy from the north. And then they introduced me that this is the girl that did the building. The girl looked at me, yeah, yeah, as in this girl. Yes, age is irrelevant. So do not let anybody despise your age. Innovation, response to change has nothing to do with your age. It has to do with your knowledge. So you must educate yourself. You must keep yourself engaged. You must be on top of what is going on in your industry. It's part of the only way you can be proactive. Because if you have full knowledge of industry shifts, you can make decisions ahead of the game. You can position and realign your business. You can make the right relationships. You can see where the market is going. That allows you to make decisions for yourself, to find the right alliances, to cut off things and move. When I started my business in furniture, I was producing home and office. But within two years, just from looking at the landscape, I realized, you know what, I really don't like doing home furniture. It's too tedious. In your sitting room, what do you have? Three seaters so far, two seaters so far, single, your side table and everything. They're all different, but I need to make all of them work together. How? And this one, your dining table has different chairs. I don't want chaise lounge. I decided that what I'd like is to produce large numbers of the same thing at the best quality and deliver to the market. That pitched me for office furniture. And I took a decision that we're just going to be an office furniture company. We're not going to produce. Everybody thought I was stupid. Because they said to me, ah, how can you give up one side of it? When one side is not selling, the other side will be selling. But you must know what, where you're going enough to stand by your decision of pivoting. Because at that point, I decided, and we became the first office furniture focused company that gave us miles of advantage because for me in fact i was as specific as the fact that i was not really interested in the chief executive or the dgm agm tables because how many one md in one company five agms how many count all of them maybe like 10 even give them 50. how many workers work in a bank 
So I'd rather produce your 5,000, 10,000, 2,000 ones multiplied as you open the branches, I'm the one running with it, than producing just a few people at your head office. I'm not interested. But you have to have understanding in order to make critical decisions that allow your business to move in a certain direction as the market itself moves for you. So educate yourself, empower yourself, have all the information that you need. Your vision must be clear once you make the decision. But if you have that clarity of, of vision, you must be able to communicate it to the people that work with you. They're not going to get into your head. No. So you need to find a simple, honest way to communicate your vision to the guys who work for you. You cannot be a superhero when you're leading change. Because no matter how much you know, there's so many facets of change that you do not know. There are many missing points and there are gaps that you need other people's knowledge. And which is part of where women are strong. You know, we're community builders. We build, we bring people together. We're naturals. So you can be open to, you have listening ears for your children. The same skills you use in building your home, take them to work. It makes you a strong leader of change. Because you have to tolerate in-laws, sons, house elves, you know, neighbors, all sort of people that we need to tell. Your husband can work with you, hello, and not answer people. And you keep making excuses for him. But you are the one that manages everybody together. It's a strong tool when you're leading change. Because the least person in your organization might be the one that has the missing link. And you need to be a listener. You want to listen to everyone. You want to encourage them to voice their opinion. You, you have to explain the change plan. You must show them the short term, the long term, the medium term side of it so they can follow you. Within your team, you must pick those who are responsible. Pick leaders within the value chain. Give others responsibility of power. Don't hold all the power to yourself. Because if anything happens to you, then what happens to the plan? So you cannot be the all-knowing. You know, part of how we lost a lot of industries in this country Many great businesses that were built over time is because we used to have macho leaders. Guys who built amazing companies, but they controlled everything. The decision point was just one point. It's whatever they said. They had people who respond and act on their instructions, but were not trained to think about how to give the instructions. And once they died, the businesses died with them because they didn't build a pipeline of leaders. They they built a pipeline of followers and people who just receive instruction. We can't afford to do that. We're a different generation. And I'm not the one pressing. Somebody is pressing and something is changing. <laughs> I, I didn't jump, but it's jumped me to somewhere I haven't gotten to. Anyway, change leader, competent management. Do not be afraid. When you realize that you're in a process of change and you define what the change agenda is, Sometimes you're going to have to let some people go and you're going to have to find some new people because every time it's like growth within an organization. Every time you get to a new level of growth, you actually have a new company. You do not have the same company because the tools that got you there will not take you to the next place. And sometimes you must have the courage to look people in the eye and say, thank you very much. You know, either you reassign them to where they can still be relevant or you help them to move forward and you must do yourself the service of finding the right people for where you are. It is where the emotions of women can become a weakness. But it is where the kindness of our heart can become an asset because you can disengage people kindly and you can do it badly. So there are two different ways. So always try to use the things that are natural to you in the best way. Develop employees. Investment in your empl employees will always be for your benefit. Empower your employees. Give them real power. Don't give people responsibility without power. You make them very vulnerable. They can't do much. Make change visible. Let people be able to envision what it is that you're envisioning. They must be able to see where you want to go to and go with you and think with you and help you to build uh, the, the future that is possible. Now, your change can be accidental, as I said earlier. It can be forced. Law can force your change. So it doesn't matter. It can be deliberate. It doesn't matter what leads to your change. What is important is what you do with it, how you respond to it, and the actions that you take. Just know that whatever your beginning is, 
you must know where you're trying to get to. You must have a sense. I always say a sense of it. Why do I use the word sense? It's because along the path of going from where you are to where you want to go to, life can happen as well. Realities can happen that will make, require you to make changes to your change plan. And therefore, you must be flexible and responsive to it, which means you must be humble. You cannot be arrogant. You don't know everything. A child will tell you. A customer will tell you. People who work with you will tell you. And you listen to others. For those who are Christians, the Bible says in the multitude of counsel, there is safety. But counsel is information. It is what you do with the information that makes a difference as to where you go to. Because you can have all the information, but if you make the wrong decisions, you will not achieve what is your goal. Now, as a leader, if you don't know where you're going, how can others even follow you? And how can you get there? Because getting there is about making the right decisions to be able to, to get there. Now, to lead organizational change, what, what do you need to do? You must communicate it. Okay, you're there. You're riding with me. Thank you very much. So I'm going to drop this. Just follow me. Once I call it out, you change it. It's faster for me. You communicate the vision and go vividly. Be transparent, be trustworthy, and lead by example. How? Show the roadmap. Don't assume it. Don't leave it to suggestion. Have a clear roadmap. And as much as you can, follow the roadmap and make the decision to amend the roadmap based on factual situations and a decision that is collective. And then everybody is instructed on how. Then who? Invite the right people to participate, whether they're consultants, whether they're employees. Find your right team for where you want to go to. Your old team might have been good for where you are, like I said earlier, but you need to be sure that for where you want to go to now, what is your right team to do that? And you need to make that change. Like during COVID, a lot of companies had to find how to survive. And finding how to survive including, included restructuring your staff strength included having some areas you know disengage having some people leave reorganize what your focus is in order to survive that season first and coming out of it certain businesses have changed forever ask the real estate people right now office space and all of that in some parts of the world you know they're having problem letting out the space because why work nature has changed a lot of people are working from home. Companies need less square meters to keep people. What about people that build thousands of square meters of space for companies to use? Now companies need half of that. How do they pivot the businesses? How do we change the whole environment of work? When we're used to clustering together to think, can we really think effectively virtually? There are gaps there. So obviously, hybrids are being created. Why? Because we realize that first we all went, it's all virtual, and then we found out, ah, actually, it's not working. I don't think I can survive a fully virtual world because I like the energy of human beings, you know, and I like the conversation that we have. And I think there's a lot that is unsaid, unspoken, when people meet, that you gain from engaging with each other. And some people, you know what keeps them away from depression? Coming to the office, meeting with other people encouragement smile feeling valued so we didn't realize how tangible it was until we don't have it and then you realize a lot of people are actually in trouble because of that so that has uh, increased around the world now let's go to stages thank you now you must accept what the issue is when you accept it adapt and adopt where it is necessary as you go along implementing your change you must adapt and you must adopt. Refine over time. Take stock in between at every stage that you're moving. When you take stock, revise from time to time. Measure the progress that you're making along the way. And if it's not working, sometimes, no matter how much you have put into it, you have to understand that you need to let it go. And you must be able to make that hard decision. But you must also do it smartly. You know, there's one of my saddest stories is uh, a friend of mine, brilliant, she's a professional, built a company in creative like Nike, did amazing things with her hands and stuff like that. And at one point, she was so frustrated with the business. So all the issues and problems that come with the business industry. And 
she just decided, you know what, I'm done. I said, okay, you're done. She gave our staff all sorts of the things she was doing, allowed them to go, said you can continue the business on your own, shut down everything and walked away with nothing. When I found out, I said, are you insane? Because you invested so much of your time to build this business. You're the best in what you do. People value what you do. Why would you just walk away? I don't mind that you say you're tired of the business, but at least sell it. Take value from it. Or if you're not going to sell it, get somebody else to run it. Yes. So you see, if you don't program your mind for change, when change happens around you, you can have drastic reactions. And I've watched women in particular take drastic reactions with businesses they have invested in. She just literally gave everything away. You know the funny part? A few years after, she came back to restart again. Yes. Because she was amazing at what she did. And she destroyed value when she took that decision. I almost killed her the day she told me. I'm like, why? Couldn't you have just spoken to someone and asked? She said, I'm just tired. That's your emotions. Who cares? When you're tired, look for right sense, which is why you must have the right tribe around you. You must always have a support system that keeps you in control. So that when you're exhibiting the madness of the moment, there's a right a voice that says, do what? I better go and sit down. At least they would stop you from taking the action until it's necessary. She literally destroyed her own business by herself. By the time she came back, all her customers are gone to her staff that she gave and she gave them all her tools as well yes it's true the, the only thing is they can't take her creativity they could only produce to the point of where she stopped but she could pick up from there and create new ideas and she did but i think where she is now compared to where she would have been if she moved it's also why you need knowledge how does business work how does business work i'm tired of business so there are options do I sell it? I went through this process with somebody else of recent. Brilliant, amazing, committed, built a great business. But she was at a point where all the pressure of change around was getting to her. She was tired. She was really tired of the business. She just wanted to get away from it. And then because she was tired and acting like that, her husband, she was frustrating him as well in her action and her reaction. And then he called me and said, we're coming to see you. So they came. We sat down. We talked about it. At that point, she was talking to some consulting firm who said, okay, you know what? We'll take the business from you at zero. We will work it to produce results over the next three years. By the third year point and all of that, we will return this kind of value to you. All the value they will return to her would have been generated from the business that she built. What, what were they putting on the table? Nothing. What was the basis of the reaction? Her emotions, her frustration, her tiredness in a process of change and the pressure that Nigeria can sometimes put on you. She was responding to it and he had gotten to her. Now, understandably, there are days we just don't want anything to do with business anymore. But you don't run away because change will always happen. So eventually what she's done, a beautiful thing now, so at a point, I just put my foot down and said, no, you're not. You're not. I mean, this, you will cry in a short while when you realize that this is the biggest mistake of your life if you make it. That's so I do not permit you to sign this contract. Because they had a contract, they had a presentation. I said, you will cry. This is going to make you so sad. You'll feel stupid if you do it. And then she walked through. I told her, go and pray. Go, just take some time off. Don't go to work. Don't do anything. Sometimes in the process of change, detach yourself from the situation. Find the right voices around you. Talk to them. Find your support system. Find your tribe. Let them lift you up and help you through. Find people that have experiences in your industry. If you're in fashion, go to Enike. She will tell you five stories, ten stories, twenty stories of moments when it felt like she should just walk away. But she didn't. Find whatever the industry is, find them, talk to them, lean on their experience. And then find how you walk yourself out of it with value. Never to destroy value. At the end, now, she's handed over 
to a CEO to run the business. She's going to focus on what she's best at. You know, the part that she's tired of, somebody else can take it off. The company is going to do so well. I am confident of that because of the structure of change and the process that is ongoing. It can happen to you too. So I need you to understand that you must adapt, you must adopt when it's necessary. Every, at every stage of your business, refine over time because things happen around you. How you feel about your business can change. Refine your decision concerning that. Sometimes, oh, I want to be MD till I'm 70. Okay. If you get to 50 and you're tired, just know that you need to get out. But the business doesn't need to go anywhere. Just find somebody else who is happy to be CEO at that point and let them run it. And then you can go on doing other things with your life. You know, I told myself at 31, I was going to get away from my business when I'm 50. Now at 50, I will not want to run my business anymore. And I started planning it since that when I was pregnant with my second son, and at a point I just said to myself, I want a life. By 50, I do not want to be responsible for this business. I want somebody else to do it, but I want to watch the transition so I'll know if I made the right decisions and I can adjust it. At 48, I invited a firm and said, help me to put all these companies I'm building, put them together. That's how we set up the group structure. Find all the elements of leadership within and outside. And please, the only thing I want to be is a customer to the business, strategy and new business. And let me look from the outside in. For all the things I've done in the last 12 years, is because I've been free from my own business. Because I had made that decision ahead. Not that I could see the things I then came to do. It was just that it was a desire in my heart and I got myself out. And even now, there are many times that you feel tempted to want to jump in again. And I made sure I never did. Why? Because if that business doesn't work well when I'm not there, I've wasted my life. And like I said, it's been 35 years of my life invested in it. So I do not want it to be considered as with. Revise from time to time. Measure the pro progress along the way. Sometimes you're going to have to sell. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes your partners will change. Sometimes the kind of investment you take in. Because, you know, especially for those of you who are in tech, everybody's excited by, oh, I'm doing round B, I'm doing round C, I'm doing round D. Is it for free? No. It's not. So be sure why each round, what you're doing there. Be sure what you're building. Because sometimes people don't really know what they're building. They know I'm building a business and raising funds is funky. Yes. What is your long-term vision? What, what is your end game? How do you want to finish? Is this just a way to build a name and make money and get out of it and go and start again? If that's what your plan is, that's fine. But if it's not, then make sure that you're using the right strategy. It's not enough. To just be, oh, we're raising this. I, hear, I always laugh half the time. Now, well, good for you. As long as that's where you want to, you want to be. Oh, sorry. Okay. So in that, define your success. But when I'm talking about you defining your success, you guys change your slide yourself. Oh. <laughs> when I'm talking about you defining your success, is because you want to know what your end game is. As an entrepreneur, how do you want to finish? Nika in telling her story told you at the end it was about the transition. How she would transition. Because when she transitions, the legacy of rough and tumble will be standing. When I left, the chair center group is still there and they're still running. And I hope that long after I'm gone, they're still there and they're still running. Because I've spent my life doing that. What, how do you want to finish? What, is, what does success look like for you? Because if you do a SWOT analysis right now, between where you are and how you want to finish, it will guide the decisions you make. It will lead you to make the right decisions. The story of your life or the story of your business is about the accumulation of the decisions you make every day concerning that business. It's about the opportunities you choose to take and the ones you do not. Because some opportunities are toxic for you. They're toxic for your long term. You do not. They're investors that have money, but their money will poison the pot of your business. Depending on where you want to go, what is, is every money good enough? Or you have a value system that drives your standards and the things you will not touch. Are you proud to say that I'm building a company that no matter where the investors come from, the values of my company will pass the mark? Why? Because we're doing the right things. It's not just about the numbers. When we do the right things overall at the end, our numbers will speak. 
Somewhere in between, it might look like we're slower, slower than others. That's one more thing I learned in building my business in 35 years. There were moments when it looked like, ah, you're slower because of all these values and all of that. Ultimately, it worked for me. Ultimately, it speaks by itself. Three years ago, when we had, from my work at First Bank, when we had the battle with Emi Fili, it looked like we were insane. We couldn't speak because people didn't understand. In a sensitive industry, you don't talk anyhow. There are positions and roles you occupy that require restraint. And for the sake of a nation and an institution, you will not speak. Because it was more costly for you to do that. So you let it pass. And you let people that know, people that don't know, everybody talks what they talk. But you know that at the right time, the truth will speak. It didn't take too long. It's spoken so much in the last one year. You know, it's, so you must decide who you are. You must decide what you want your legacy to be. You must decide how you want to finish. You must decide what truth you want to live by. Because things will continue to change around you. But you cannot afford to change anyhow. Because that makes all the difference. Because circumstances, oh, it was interesting. Oh, she's on this global thing, she's on that global. Let me tell you, all that drama they did then, I had to answer for it globally. I had to. I had to face panels on a global level to answer to it. Painful. Because you know the truth. But you know, my 19-year-old son said something to me. On one day when I had one of those calls, and I finished and I was mad. I was really upset. My son saw me. What's wrong, mommy? And I said, you know, I'm so mad. I live my life a certain way, so I never have to answer to certain kind of questions. My son said to me, mommy, don't worry. By the time they finish this, their process, as in all these international people that we're going through a process, they think they know you now, but by the time they're done, they will really know you. And when they really know you, it will work for your advantage. My son was a prophet. Because ultimately, that's what happened. I went through two major ones, one on the American side, one on the British side. And by the time they were done, I sit in some places that I sit now because those things worked for me. So ask yourself how you want to finish. What does success mean to you? Bank balance, if you do what you do well, you'll always have the bank balance. A good name, your reputation as a child of God, your family name, the legacy you hand over to your children. Life, things will change around you. But some things must never change about you. And that is the most critical thing you must hold on to. To remember that change is part of life. But life, you control it by the decisions that you make. Go to the final slide that says, failure is not fatal. No. Thank you. Failure is not fatal. But failure to change might be. So sometimes you will mess up. Sometimes you will miss it. That's fine. It's a transit point. My attitude to failure is, is, is meaningless. It's you deciding on the final situation of, a, of something when you're in the middle of it. How can you tell how it will end? There are points in your life that are meant to teach you things. Those things they teach you are valuable for places you will go to later. There's no other way to pick it up. I cannot replace some of my learnings through the battles. There was no other place. So I remember there's a board that I chair internationally now, and we're having some crisis situation, and I had to manage all sort of their investors and all of that, and we had a situation. And by the time we were done, all the guys on the board came to me and said, Hibuku, how could you manage everything like that? I looked at them and thought, child's play from where I'm coming from. <laughs> yeah, it was child's play to me. i have been trained through the toughest seasons. And those seasons have shaped character in me. The Bible says the trial of your faith does what? Work at patience. The things you will go through, whether through your change process or your building process, will define and nurture who you are but they won't kill you. Failure is not fatal. Things might not work, but they're a temporary situation. The only time you can know if you fail is when you die and you haven't accomplished the things you set out to. Control your end narrative. This is your remote control of your life. Never hand it over to anyone. Make sure it's permanently in your hands. And how do you control your life? Your decisions. 
every day. Make the right decisions for you to be able to get to where you're going. And we will win all of the time. Thank you.